This is A to Z with Mark Zinno, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it starts now. Good afternoon. Welcome to A to Z here on Locked On Sports Atlanta, where today I tell you it's not because we want to, it's just because we have to. Welcome in. We are live here on this Tuesday. Actually, I'm lying. I should say good morning because we have playoff baseball today, and I wanted to get the show in before the playoffs. Game one of the NLDS start between the Braves and the Phillies. So uh, with this uh, you know, early first pitch here, this one o'clock first pitch, I wanted to make sure that we were all locked and loaded ahead of time we get the pod out to you. Uh, to start your Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining me. Give us a follow on Twitter at Locked On ETL. Of course, Matt Mark Zinno, M A R K Z I N N O. Don't forget to download that Roku TV app on your Amazon Fire Stick or wherever you get Roku TV. Check out Locked On Sports Atlanta on Roku all day, every day. All the shows here on the network. Lot to do. Uh, we will get into the Braves and Phillies coming up. And one stat that will define the entire NLDS. I'll get to that coming up as well. It happened again last night on Monday Night Football, and the NFL needs to fix it. We'll do that. But first, let's start with the Atlanta Falcons. Um, spoke to Arthur Smith yesterday. And guys, I, listen, I'll tell you this much. I have been critical of Arthur Smith with the media and, and at times have accused him of being surly. Uh, as you get out there more and you get a little bit more into the season, uh, I mean, Arthur Smith is a really genuine dude. Uh, he's not everything you see. Yes, when he answers questions in press conferences, he seems pissed off and he seems like, you know, there's a chip on his shoulder and, and he's got like a little bit of an attitude and everything else. But, you know, um, you, you get to talk to him a little bit off the air or away from a microphone. And he's a pretty genuine guy. He's very likable. Uh, he's very relatable. But, you know, in short, when, when it comes to press conferences, answering questions about games, like a lot of coaches, he's a little bit tight lipped and a little bit more reserved and, and curt, if you will. So I will say that much for him. But, you know, I, I mean, <sighs> All things considered, guys, the fact that this team is sitting here at two and three and has been competitive in every single game that they've played is more than in reality should you should ever ask for. Remember, I told you this after the first two losses. Stay at the 30,000-foot view of this team. Don't get sucked down into the weeds because it's likely going to lead to some disappointment for you. That said, um, you know, they, they've had two games that were – fairly winnable that they had a real solid chance to win that they didn't. And, you know, uh, you get frustrated at that. But the fact that this team is as competitive as they are speaks volumes. I will add one other thing um, that this team finally has an identity. And that's all due to Arthur Smith. They finally have an identity and their identity is running the ball. Power football, if you will. We talked yesterday. And I even tweeted this out. The Falcons are have the third best rushing attack in the NFL, averaging 164.6 yards per game. They also have the third worst passing attack in the NFL, averaging 166.8 yards per game. That's just 2.2 more yards passing per game than running. Now, my colleague Josh Kendall of The Athletic wrote a column uh, this morning titled, uh, Why the Falcons Keep Running the Ball No Matter the Score or the opponent, and it goes in to tell you, again, remember, they ran 14 straight times against the Cleveland Browns. They ran 12 uh, plays, running plays, despite being down two scores late in the game. And the tenor of the column, and I'm not saying necessarily Josh is saying this 100%, but the tenor of the column is, is that the Falcons will keep running the ball because that's who they are. Even got quotes in the Buccaneers saying how surprised they were that the Falcons kept running the football. Guys, it's, it's not because they want to keep running the football. It's because they need to keep running the football because, in short, passing the ball is not always a net positive for this team. You know, I asked Arthur Smith succinctly uh, about the numbers running and passing, and I just said that those numbers need to look a little bit different because Arthur Smith is a lot about balance. He wants to be balanced. All coaches want to be balanced. In theory, they all say it. But, you know, those numbers need to change. And he was rationalizing it, and he admitted he was rationalizing it, but in short, sort of alluding to the fact that, yes, we want to be better in the past game, but kind of this is who we are. You have to remember, guys, Marcus Mariota does a lot of things that are plus 
positive, net positive plays that other quarterbacks can't make. How he keeps things alive with his legs, makes a certain completion when he needs to. Overall, the numbers look bad. Overall, the passing game feels bad. But situationally, it's not as bad as we want it to be, nor is it nor as bad as Arthur Smith would ever acknowledge that it may be. And it's two things. One, they're not going to make a quarterback change until they are completely out of it, right? Until they've been eliminated from making the postseason. They will not make a quarterback change. Or the play gets so bad, and I told you this last week, or the play gets so bad that they can no longer tolerate it. And the play is never going to get that bad. Because Marcus Mariota isn't that bad. He's just not that good either. Like, that's genuinely what this boils down to. Marcus Mariota, and I read you the numbers yesterday, guys, and I still got him here. He's completed just five passes in the first half in each of the last two games and did not even reach 100 yards. You want to know what my best bet of the week is? San Francisco minus two and a half in the first half. Why? Because with those passing numbers, unless you give up major running plays, guess what? You're not scoring. Falcons only scored 10 points against the Browns in the first half. They scored no points against the Buccaneers. Who has the better defense of the three teams over the last three weeks? 49ers, Buccaneers, or Browns? Yeah, it's the 49ers. Falcons first half under feels glorious because they can't throw the ball. It's not because they don't want to. It's because Arthur Smith is smart enough, and give him credit, he's smart enough to know that if I do this more than what I've done, if I attempt more than 10 passes against the Browns, or 14 passes because I was down 21 to nothing by against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Guess what? It's going to end up being worse for me. All I can do is chip away at the run game as best I can and try to get points up on the board. Young Way Koo missed a field goal. That may have changed things a little bit uh, down the stretch. But still, the point simply is that this is a offense right now that is net negative in the pass game and it's going to stay that way so they're going to continue to run the football just is what it is guys i mean we you, you can take that spin and it feels negative you can take look how good this run game is they can count on it no matter who they're playing against whatever opponent and they're going to be successful running the game i think there's some truth to that that's the positive way to look at it the negative way to look at it says they're really bad in the passing game, and they're going to continue to be bad in the passing game because, well, they have a highly limited quarterback. You know, that's what it boils down to. One other thing I didn't get to yesterday that I just, you know, would, did want to comment today, and I didn't even get to it yesterday because I didn't, I, you know, for me generally, it's a non story because this finally this whole Deion Jones saga ends. The Falcons trade him away along with a seventh round pick to get a sixth round pick. Deion Jones was so untradeable, the Falcons actually had to give a, a pick away with him to get one back. On the upside, the only thing that happens is that after this year, there is no dead cap money. I guess that was the reason for wanting to trade him because if they didn't, he still would have had dead cap money next year. Now, granted, it wouldn't have been prohibitive uh, comparatively speaking to this year, but nonetheless, they would have had dead cap money. Now all that goes away because the Browns assume the contract. So there's that. But I'm glad it's over. I can't, that's how desperate somebody had to be. The Cleveland Browns can't stop anybody right now uh, in the run game. And they need somebody who can tackle. And Deion Jones can at least do that. So that's why he finally got traded because somebody got that desperate that they were willing to offer a sixth round pick, but said, yeah, we're not doing it unless you give us a, another pick in return because we're taking on this massive contract for a below average player. I'm glad this saga is over. I'm glad the last vestiges of, and I don't say this pejorative to Thomas Dimitrov and Dan Quinn because I like them both. I've always respected them both. The last major vestiges of that sort of era are gone with the exception of a very good Jake Matthews, a very good Grady Jarrett, and a very good A.J. Terrell. That's, you know, where they are. That's the last vestiges of those dudes. So the three best players that, that hold over from that era are still here. Good. Other than that, the rest of them, sayonara. Deuces, folks. Peace. All right, coming up, the one stat that's going to define the absolute 
finality of this NLDS. But first, a word from our friends at betonline.net, your fastest and easiest way to check in on all your sports betting needs. Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. You get news and reviews of every league, obviously NFL and college football, huge right now. Major League Baseball playoffs continuing. Rays Phillies today, obviously. NBA right around the corner. NHL just getting underway. Combat sports, esports, even golf. It's all right there as BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline, where the game starts. Okay, uh, Braves, Phillies coming up here at 1 o'clock today at Truist Park. You'll get Max Fried against Ranger Juarez. Ranger Suarez. Um, Suarez, a three, six, five ERA, a 1.33 whip, 10 and seven on the year. Nothing special. He's had some good starts. And as a matter of fact, he hasn't, he's had a couple of decent starts against the Braves. If I recall, I got to check his splits real quick, but you know, this is a pitching matchup today that favors the, uh, favors the Braves. He, he did have one win. He's one and two against the Braves this year, 28 innings pitched. Uh, he's given up 10 earned runs. And 23 hits. He gave up three home runs, 12 walks, though. Dear Lord. To walk almost every other inning. So, uh, yeah. And he does have 23 strikeouts. He's got more against the Braves than any other team, partly because they're in his division and they played three times. But you make it that what you will. So, um, here's the thing. And I'll give you a set of stats here. One of these is from Justin Toscano of the AJC. Uh, and the other one is from... The good folks uh, at Data Scribe on ESPN.com. I don't like to take credit for stats that aren't mine, uh, or at least ones I didn't research on my own. But nonetheless, the key to this series, folks, the Braves get the ball out of the ballpark, they're going to win. If they don't, they're going to lose. And that seems obvious. The Braves lost their first seven games in September when they didn't hit a home run, they went one and seven down the stretch. When they failed to hit a home run, the Braves need to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Period. They finished second in the majors on the Yankees with 243 home runs. Their OPS as a team, 760, was tied for second in Major League Baseball. Get this the Phillies are 51 and 20 in games they did not allow a home run. That's pretty good. You know, that's almost like the, the pace that the Braves played the entire second half of the year since June 1st. If somehow the Phillies can keep the Braves in the ballpark, they'll have a great chance to win each game. If the Braves start hitting home runs, they'll always, always, always have a shot to win. And that's the thing about the Braves lineup one through nine. We don't know 100% yet what the division series, as we're, as we're recording this this morning, what the division series roster is uh, and, and who's going to be on it. But it's one through nine, the Braves – have guys that can hit the ball out of the ballpark, and that's important. And so do the Phillies, by the way. I mean, look, the Phillies lineup is is still very, very good. It's it's not a lineup that you you look at and you go, oh, we don't have, you know we don't have to worry about those. No, that, that team hits. They've hit all year long. I mean, they 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 just have. Uh, it's a team that that hits a lot of home runs, uh, and a team that you know, it's guys who can bop the baseball. I mean, don't forget, you know, the Phillies were fourth in average, tied, yeah, tied for fourth in average. Uh, and they were right behind the Braves in home runs. They had 205. The Braves had 243. So this is not a lineup that that is scared of scoring. And again, Braves were second with 789 runs. Phillies had 747. I mean, they're all right there. So it's not like there's a lot of separation offensively between these two teams. Pitching, the Braves have the edge. And that's obviously the other big thing. Should I go back to it? You all know where I'm going. Spencer Strider. If he's pitching, the Braves are winning the series. Done. Period. It's that simple. They're not going to get through Freed twice and Strider once. They're just not. And right now, they have Kyle Wright slated as a Game 2 starter. Game 3, undecided. We'll know today if that's the case. We will know today in a couple of hours if Spencer Strider is going to be available. If he is, I love their chances. If he's not, I'm nervous. Guys, yes. I, I know you guys all think that like when I keep talking about Strider, I'm over the top about it. One pitcher can make that much of a difference in a series. Absolutely, they can. 
Go see what Clayton Kershaw did for years. You know, Justin Verlander. Go see what he's done for years and how they make a difference. I mean, it's as simple as Red Sox couldn't win a World Series with Pedro. Add Kurt Schilling, look what happens. It is a huge difference. One guy, one starter can change the scope of your playoff run that much. So don't underscore for one second how good, uh, how good Spencer Strider and what he means to this team. So make it that what you will. I still like the Braves here. Um, you know, I think this sets up for a Braves Dodgers NLDS, something that we've all been sort of wanting to see all year long. And, uh, you know, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but getting game one is going to be huge. Getting game one here today in a sleepy 107 start. Um, I keep seeing that the game is sold out, but there's people saying that there are tickets available online. And I'm like, well, the game sold out. How are tickets available online? I guess they're on the secondary market, but why would you want to get rid of your ticket? I suppose you put them on there. If somebody makes you a big enough offer, you're willing not to go to the game, all those things in place, blah, 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 blah. I expect to see a very loud and packed Truist Park come 107 today. Battery is going to be pumping, folks. Battery is going to be pumping. All right. Uh, we got to get the shovels of wisdom in. The entire final segment of the show will be a shovel dedicated to, well, I'm sure you can figure it out. But first, let me tell you guys about Built Bars and Built Bar Puffs. If you haven't tried them, you're, de you're depriving your life of one of the greatest joys. Guess what? There's a new flavor. It's delicious, indulgent cookie dough puffs. They're covered in chocolate. That's right. Cookie dough chunk have a light and chewy texture. They're covered in 100% real chocolate, only 160 calories, 15 grams of protein. These things are delicious. Go to built.com, snag a box for the entire family, or just keep it for yourself. Whatever. I mean, you can be selfish about this. They're that delicious that you'll want to hide them from everybody else. And they are the perfect snack, guys. In between meals, when you just want something small that'll hold you over, does the job. After dinner, late at night, you know, you don't want to eat maybe past 8, 9 o'clock at night, but you still got that craving in your stomach, grab the Built Bar, grab the Puffs, cookie dough, chunk. It is absolutely worth it. Healthy for you. Tastes delicious. It is the perfect, perfect snack. Go to Built.com and use the promo code Locked On, and you'll get, I'm sorry, Locked On 15, rather, and you'll get 15% off your first order. Again, use promo code Locked On 15 at Built.com and get the cookie dough, chunk, Puffs. All right, time for... Shovels of Wisdom. Brace yourselves, because it's time for the Shovel of Wisdom. Yeah, you know how we do it every day. We have to set somebody straight, and boy, this is going to be a repeat one. I'm not even going to go through it. If you want to leave a shovel, go to my Twitter account, at Mark Zino, M-A-R-K-Z-I-N-N-O. Use the hashtag Shovel of Wisdom. Today, my shovel goes to the NFL. Why? Because it happened again. So here's a second shovel. There you go. Now I feel better. Last night, if you watched Monday Night Football, you would have seen what uh, can only be described as an awful, awful, awful roughing the passer call against Chris Jones of the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, who stripped Patrick Mahomes, was sacking him and knocking him down, fell on top of him. And the reason, the justification for the roughing the passer penalty was that he landed all of his weight on top of him, even though Chris Jones stole the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' hand, had that in one hand, braced his hand on the ground to not land on top of him with all of his weight, still got the flag. Chiefs go on to win the game, but it could have cost him. And uh, yeah. Here's the problem. I'm not I'm not at Jerome Boger and Carl Cheffers, who was the referee last night in Monday Night Football. I mean, they're bad calls, and they deserve to be absolutely held accountable. There's no doubt about that. But what I'm complaining about and who I'm at is the NFL. I, I, there has been nobody. I don't know if there's been anybody who has been more in the media, who's more pro-player safety than me. Like, the head hits to me are all disgusting. And, and there's literally no reason that they should be happening in this game anymore. It should be a one-off Every couple of weeks that it happens, not once a week where somebody is getting knocked out of a game with a concussion, okay? You can mitigate and almost eradicate concussions from the game if you do it the right way. I truly believe that. That said, I am holding to the stance, one, that all penalties need to be reviewed, and two, 
that we need to rewrite the rules on roughing the passer. This is absolutely ridiculous at this point in time. The NFL can easily draw a clear distinction between preventing concussions, head safety, and regular player safety. Guess what? There's an easy way to define whether a quarterback gets nailed in the head and possibly has a concussion, which is bad, and those things are not okay, and we don't want them, and, oh, a separated shoulder. You'll live. Now, this all goes back to, and I think it was Anthony Barr was the linebacker from the Vikings. I have to go back, but it was a couple of years ago. Barr was chasing down Aaron Rodgers, who was rolling to his right. Barr caught up to him, grabbed him, fell on top of him. Rodgers landed on his right shoulder, dislocated it, missed seven games, whatever it was, and the Packers missed the playoffs that year. That's where this you can't fall on the quarterback rule came from. Guess what? There's a big difference between knocking a quarterback over and gravity taking you down. And a player clear if if a player can be seen placing his hand on the ground to break the fall, then guess what? The player is doing the best interest of the safety of the quarterback. If he doesn't do that and doesn't brace himself and uses the quarterback's body to brace himself from hitting the ground, fine. That's a different conversation. But again, back to why every single damn penalty needs to be reviewable. We don't need to change anything in the game. The system is already in place. The rules are already in place. If a coach wants to use a challenge flag on a penalty, by all means, coach, you decide when that happens. If you'd like to blow it on a holding call in the first quarter, knock yourself out. If you'd like to use both of your challenges before halftime and have none in the second half, knock yourself out. Then we get to blame the coach for not managing their challenges correctly when a questionable roughing the passer or pass interference comes down the stretch. I I don't understand. Even Chris Jones said it last night. Grady Jarrett said it today earlier here on Atlanta Radio that, you know, let's all be open to reviewing penalties. Like, there is a system in place to fix the human element and the human error of the game to keep the, quote, integrity of the game intact. And the NFL won't let anybody use it. If you don't want quarterbacks hurt, fine. But Patrick Mahomes didn't get hurt last night. He wasn't in danger of getting hurt. Tom Brady didn't get hurt on Sunday, and he wasn't in danger of getting hurt on Sunday. And both of those egregiously wrong calls need to be able to be addressed and fixed during the game. And furthermore, the NFL needs to put out an an officiating report just like the NBA does. Because I tell you what, this pool reporter stuff is now complete crap. If you read Carl Cheffer's justification for the call, complete crap. Especially since Chandler Jones had stripped the ball out of, uh, Chris Jones rather, not Chandler, had stripped the ball out of, of Derek Carr's hands and was holding it in one hand. So he literally could not be hitting the quarterback with anything other than one half of his body because he had the football in the other arm. And oh, by the way, You're getting better justification and better explanation and better depth of what actually is going on from the the, the officials who do the television broadcast. Dean Blandino, Mike Pereira, they're all doing a better job at explaining this than the pool reporter does with the referee after the game. It's a waste of time. It's crap now. There's no reason to even do it. You're not getting any more clarity at all. And, and, and the pool reporter gets like two questions, and that's it. There's no lengthy conversation. It's a waste of time. The NFL needs to put out an officiating report and grade these dudes publicly, period. What they want to do behind closed doors, fine. You'll have a hard time justifying why the same ref ends up in the, you know, final five-minute report or whatever it is that they're going to have, and yet you're going to put them in the Super Bowl. You know you're not going to do that anyway. I mean, the NBA has had, had the, the, these reports for several years now. The same referees are still hanging around. No one's getting fired because they're all union guys, which is fine, again. But at least the at least a coach knows that if a referee continually makes bad calls, guess what? Going into that game, I need to save my challenges for when I really need them because at some point in time, you know, I may need it down the road at a more critical juncture in the game. You have to give the coach that information. I mean, all this stuff is important. That's all it is, is information sharing. All it is. There's nothing wrong with putting out an official officiating report saying where where they got it right and where they got it wrong. 
Baseball does it now. They're tracking umpires' ability for strikes. You know that little little box that's there? I, I guess that's the God box because if it's in that box, it's a strike. If it's not, it's a ball. And guess what? Umpires get graded on it. Are they hitter-friendly? Are they pitcher-friendly? They all have tendencies. It's natural. It's what humans do. We all have tendencies, too, every single day. We like to park in a certain spot. We like to put our fork and our knife on the table a certain way. We eat our dinners a certain way. We go through routines. We all develop tendencies. It's okay for referees and officials to have tendencies, but it's it's not okay to ignore the fact that those tendencies need to be tracked and given to coaches and teams as information for a game plan. It's inexcusable at this point in time. Inexcusable. It, it just is. You know, we, we do, in the military and combat, we do a ton of research and recon on the enemy, what they're going to do, how they're going to behave, what their tactics are, what sort of weapon systems they have. Why? Because that information allows us to be better prepared when we go on the offensive. Every coach should have access to that information when it is available, and it should be made available to them. And shame on the NFL for not doing it. This is tiresome. It's ridiculous. It's over the top. It can be fixed, and they won't fix it. I don't know why. You know, because billions of dollars, and we all still watch. It's our fault, obviously. think I've droned on about this long enough and made my point. I hope you all agree. Give me a follow on Twitter, at Mark Zinno, M-A-R-K-Z-I-N-N-O. Follow Locked On ATL. Subscribe and like the YouTube channel. Thumbs up to all the content there. Don't forget we're on Roku TV as well. Wherever you get your Roku TV, Amazon Fire Stick, download that Roku TV app, and check out Locked On Sports Atlanta every single day. And we appreciate you guys with all the love and support of all the shows here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Back tomorrow, hopefully celebrating a game one win for the Atlanta Braves and looking forward to the Falcons and Niners coming up. That's all tomorrow right here on A to Z on Locked On Sports Atlanta, free on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. It's Locked On Sports Atlanta. Have a great Tuesday. Go Braves. Don't take any crap from anybody. See ya.